into your presentation, which is up on the screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is, uh, this is, let's see, this would be the July 2017 edition of our Big Bear Valley Astronomical Society virtual lecture series. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Ron Lieberson. Uh, I haven't had a chance to uh, come up with a bio, so he just sent me one. Let me read it pretty much verbatim. Ron Lieberson is the Associate Lab Chief for the Planetary Magnetosphere Lab and the Magnetometer Instrument Manager for the Juno, MAVEN, Parker Solar Probe, and GOES U missions. I'm not even sure I know what uh, mm. GOES U is. Uh, he has worked at NASA Goddard for over 30 years on both astrophysics and uh, solar system missions. He has a PhD in physics from the University of Wisconsin. His favorite professional activities are optical instrumentation design and testing and ground-based obser observations. His current research is a long-term study of the lunar atmosphere using a high spectral resolution fabry perot spectrometer on the National Solar Observatory's McMath Pierce Solar Telescope, something I know a little bit about. Uh, he used the McMath Pierce for only 35 years for various solar system projects, including Comet Hale-Bopp, Io, the Io Plasma Taurus, and the Lunar Ex Exospheres, which you'll be hearing about tonight. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Leverson. Okay, uh, thank you. Let me know if you have any uh, difficulty hearing me, and please feel free to interrupt with questions at any time. Um, and you should be able to tell by the flag in the, in the, in the background that uh, I indeed come from the University of Wisconsin. Okay, um, so the uh, talk here is about when did the moon get an atmosphere. Next slide. Plug. Um, just a quick, you know, overview of the, of the moon. You know, we, we know it's about a quarter size of the Earth. You know, it's a, uh, about one eightieth the, the mass of the Earth. It's a rocky body. It's got a mean uh, density, which is similar to the Earth's crust. Um, you know, the, the main components of, you see there are iron, um, Magnesium, uh, silicon, and aluminum, and usually expressed in the various oxides that, that you see. It's we all know about its uh, rotational rates, both sidereal and synodic. Not particularly very uh, reflective, but it is a pretty cold and warm place uh, due to its very long days, and it does have uh, a uh, magnetic field, uh, at least a crustal uh, magnetic field. So if we go to the next slide, then we, uh, well, at least I grew up uh, being pretty much definitively told the moon had no atmosphere and the logic of the moon having no atmosphere basically is that there was no fading of a star occultation. It was either there or not. You know, no evidence of clouds. And if there were any gas, uh, it wasn't going to hang around. It was going to easily uh, escape. Uh, for several reasons, the low escape velocity, about a fifth of the Earth, you know, the long days just made it hot, so that would heat the gas up and make it uh, want to leave. And then if the gas got ionized, it'd be swept away by the, uh, uh, the interplanetary magnetic field. So I, I guess the talk is now done. <laughs> okay. So when, when did the moon get an atmosphere? That's the question of, of, of the talk. Pretty much through the, the Apollo program, it was um, recognized that they could have captured uh, solar wind, as well as there could be materials released from the, the, the regolith. There has always been various uh, spottings of, of some sort of emissions uh, occasionally coming out from the Earth, uh, the, the Moon's surface. So as part of the 
uh, science packages for the Apollo mission. They first put something called a code cath cathode gate, which is a, pretty much a, a cold trap, and tried to, to see uh, if it could uh, measure um, any, you know, just by mass only, um, an atmosphere. Uh, Apollo 12, that instrument didn't last very long. Apollo's 14 and 15 actually did last for years. Uh, it's a hard measurement to, to, to make, uh, in, in part because the, the, um, the long day-night cycle. When you're in the lit part of the, the sun, uh, of the moon, you're, you're constantly being bombarded by the solar wind, and so you don't know if what you're detecting is from the sun or you're detecting something that comes from the moon. So they relied primarily on measurements when the the instrument was in the on the darks, uh, you know, in, in nighttime. And so Apollo 17, they actually put a mass spectrometer on there and started to get a feel for for, for what elements they might be seeing. And you know, they came up with uh, neon, helium, hydrogen, and argon, with some upper limits to suggest maybe that it was methane, carbon dioxide, ammonia. I didn't put down water, but sometimes they uh, they speculated there was water. So once again, I can say I'm, I'm, I'm done with my talk because I told you when we found the uh, atmosphere. <laughs> okay, so accepting the fact that we have uh, an atmosphere on, on Mars, you know, the, the question that you always have to explain, at least I did to my father, because he wanted to know what it was in, in it for him. <laughs> And so I would um, say that there are basically three reasons that we want to study the, the lunar atmosphere. One, it's probably the most common type of atmosphere in the solar system, what's known as a bounded, surface bounded exosphere. Meaning that um, the atmosphere is so tenuous that there is no other interaction with other gas particles, that a gas particle pretty much is just on a ballistic uh, tra trajectory and it's so no way of stating that is that the free new free path is you know greater than how likely the particle is going to travel and some of the examples in the solar system that have attracted a lot of attention besides the the moon and mercury large asteroids you know like um series got those icy patches on it icy satellites, most notably Europa and, 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 and Enceladus. Um, and at the bottom, on the right, you know, you see a picture of Enceladus and those uh, geysers. You know, Enceladus is not a, a, a big body, but it, it does have this very tenuous uh, atmosphere being generated by um, the, uh, the water ice uh, jets that are being liberated due to tidal forces on the, on the, on the moon. So on the left side, it's just a cartoon that basically is meant to show, and we'll discuss some of the processes in the later slide, but basically particle may just go on a ballistic trajectory up and come back down. Uh, if it has a high enough energy, it, it could go directly to escape, or it could get high enough up that maybe solar wind pressure could blow it away. And you know, indicating in the green line, if it get if it, again, if it gets ionized, your neutral part is going to be uh, swept away by the interplanetary magnetosphere. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so the second reason why you might want to study the, the lunar atmosphere is just space weather. Um, you make the obvious statement that the moon is at the same distance as uh, as the Earth, so it provides another platform to. Uh, study time varying conditions due to the sun. Um, and you see the you know, radiation, solar wind, coronal mass ejections, of which certainly for you there studying the sun, you know there's a lot of interest in coronal mass ejections because of the not only pretty or, or, or worry, but the, the impacts it can have on satellites and even on uh, terrestrial like uh, electronics if the coronal mass ejection is large enough. The key here for what we're doing um, is that we have, what I'll be discussing later, is that when we're looking at the moon, um, 
we try to look at the moon as over as much as as, as we can. In the diagram on, on the right, which what you notice is that for maybe 20% of the moon's orbit, it's in the Earth's magnetotail. And as a result, for that about six days, it's actually being shielded from the solar wind particles. Um, okay, so next slide. And then finally, um, you know, human exploration. I, I, I do work for NASA, and so we're very interested in, in manned space, whether it's the moon or Mars. Um, but if it is independent of the, of the body, there are things that you need to understand that at the, the surface level to eventually expect to have some long-term habitat there. One of the um, interesting things that had been seen in, you see the picture there of September 6, was this indication of a glow around um, the, uh, uh, the, the horizon as you look towards sunrise or sunset. And um, you see that on, on the left, uh, Gene Cernan made some uh, drawings that have some similarity to the Surveyor 6 picture in that there seems to be a bright thing which it, it extends away from the uh, surface of the, of the moon. That actually is zodiac light. So it has to do with particles in the plane of the solar system and not directly with the moon. But there still is right along the, the limb of the moon towards the horizon this bright uh, sort of streak of, of light and if you look at some of the Bayer 6 images, you know, you can see that it, it takes about three hours for, for this to go away. So Gene Stern's drawings in Apollo 7 was sort of drawing the same thing you see in Surveyor 6, except for the added feature of these, of these rays. Um, people generally uh, try to describe that as, uh, you know, maybe going through mountains uh, on, on the uh, limb of, of the moon. Uh, you see a similar thing on Earth when you go through holes in the clouds. It's not sure whether or not that's what, what it is, but that's what he, what he saw. So the other uh, thing that you see in the picture, one is the, the lunar atmospheric composition experiment. I uh, mentioned earlier, this was the, the first uh, attempt at uh, getting some of the composition of the lunar atmosphere uh, directly. But one of the things which has always um, sort of fascinated me personally, uh, certainly being old enough to remember this, is uh, you know Neil Armstrong's footprint on the moon on Apollo 11. And what you're struck by when you look at that image is it's a very distinct, well-defined footprint. So you immediately know that whatever the lunar surface uh, entails, it does not have the consistency of dry sand. In fact, it's acting much more like wet sand in, in terms of how well the definition of the boot footprint it produced. Okay, well, where's maybe some ice, uh, in in um, in the lunar regolith, especially in the, in the heavily shadowed regions, in, in the polar regions, that's not water there, but in fact it's the electrostatic star in the lunar surface, sort of like a cling wrap, which is holding the, the pieces together, and then is also thought in the Surveyor six uh, images to produce uh, a levitated dust. And that levitated dust then is scattering the, the sunlight uh, from over the horizon so that you can see it. And it's not, where it's levitated, it's really not considered to be, to be very levitated very much. Um, an, an article I, I, I read on that argues that the, that the levitation is actually only a matter of inches. 
and that would be sufficient to uh, uh, get you the, uh, the right streak along the horizon. Okay, so if we go to the, the next slide then, okay, so the moon has got an atmosphere, so how could uh, we create it? Uh, ignoring the fact, I said earlier, you've got solar wind, so in that sense, you, you're getting an atmosphere. Uh, all these processes are gonna produce a temporary atmosphere. Uh, three of the four processes listed here are solar-related uh, processes. One is just oh, what's called th uh, thermal desorption, just literally you're evaporating material from, from the surface because you're baking it out in the sun, basically outgassing. Um, this, the second form of photostimulated desorption is just mainly UV photons, enough energy is being provided uh, in the top layers of, of the rock to kick out some material from the, the rock and um, not only get it out of the rock, but give it some energy so that it it goes up into the air and you know goes away from the spot where it was liberated from. And th that can be actually significant distances, both in altitude uh, and along the, the surface. And then the third mechanism, ion sputtering, is just part of being liberated by being bombarded by, by, by the sun. Now, all three of those processes being solar related uh, are only going to occur on the sunlit side of the, of the moon. So, how, however those gases and atoms have been liberated uh, from the sunlit side, once they get around to the, uh, to the, back, to the back side, they're no longer to be created. But more importantly, once these particles settle back down, they're going to stay there. And as a solar process, the greatest production of, of the atmosphere is going to occur at the, at the subsolar point, okay, i.e. where the sun is straight overhead. So the, of the four processes, then the last one, micrometer bombardment, is the one process which uh, can produce an atmosphere in any given direction. So the, the, that's an um, impact vaporization. It's sporadic, but generally believed to be symmetric in terms of where it hits on the moon. Okay, uh, next slide. So, um, what type of atmosphere? Well, we've already said it's a surface bounded exosphere. Uh, we've mentioned the, uh, some of the composition, argon, helium, neon, and hydrogen. Those were elements which were detected by Apollo uh, in the you know, early 1970s. And we're gonna talk a little bit, just a slide or two, uh, next slide in fact, uh, about um, sodium and potassium, which were discovered, discovered from the ground. Okay, so the thing to, to bear in mind in terms of, of this atmosphere is the density. So peak density, if you will, is about a thousand particles per cubic centimeter. And that's equivalent to what the uh, density in space is at the, or at the International Space Station. In comparison to, to the Earth, there's your one with 19 zeros. Uh, so, uh, it's a factor of 10 to the 13th less dense. So if we do go to the next slide, uh, so the atmosphere was confirmed on the moon in the Apollo mission, um, start, uh, I'll just say the early 1970s, Apollo 17 was 1972, obviously we know Apollo 11 was 1969, so the different experiments between Apollo 12 and 17. In 1988, first observation is actually made in 1987, um, Potter and Morgan, using both the McDonald Observatory and with Matt Pierce, just put a, a, a slit off the limb of the moon and uh, saw that there was sodium uh, emission off the limb of the moon. And so what you're looking at there in the middle, on the left-hand side, that is the Fraunhofer absorption feature 
of the reflected sunlight, and then that thing going straight up is this is the sodium emission. And as you're going up, you're going away from the limb of of, of the moon. So that was the the, the first um, de de detection, and the subsequent studies in the early 90s started to take numerous pictures of the moon. They would block out the moon and they could see that this sodium cloud was actually quite large. You'll notice um, the axis there on the right is measured in lunar radii. Okay. Um, so if we go to the, the next slide then. So we're doing a great job of creating this atmosphere, but you know we still have this problem of we're going to lose that atmosphere. So this is really a transient atmosphere. And so as while you're creating it uh, constantly, especially on the sunlit side, you are losing it because uh, of the low escape velocity. And in the bottom left hand side, you know, you're, you're seeing a, you know, a distribution that's showing you what the velocity of the particles in the lunar atmosphere or in any atmosphere might be. And then there's, there's this tail where you're above the escape velocity and you lose those atoms. So even though the majority of the atoms have a velocity less than the escape velocity, you are going to keep getting atoms, uh, getting high enough energy that you are going to deplete the reservoir of atoms if it's not continually being replenished. Um, so again, on the right, we've got a, 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 a cartoon there showing you that you, know, you liberate the particles, they can bounce around the surface, they can bounce more than once, they can be ionized to, again to be taken away by the magnetic field, or they can be actually, if they get up high enough, as I said earlier, they can be blown away, pushed away by radiation pressure. This is particularly true of sodium, and that's why you saw that big picture, uh, which was many lunar radii inside of the previous slide, um, and if you were to look in the anti-solar uh, direction at the moon, you'd actually see that there is a sodium tail. Not that anyone has photographed that sodium tail, that's a model that you're looking at there, but we've seen direct evidence because if you look in the anti-lunar direction at new moon, so the moon is between the Earth and the Sun, you will see the sodium being downstream of, of the Earth. And so you can, you can take you know, a sodium picture in that direction and you'll see this enhancement. Um, okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, start to talk a little bit about our observations which we've been making at uh, Kitt Peak um, at the McMahon. I've pretty much used almost all the telescopes on the mountain um, since I've been going to Kitt Peak since 1980. I um, actually collected my dissertation data on the 2.1 and 4 meter telescopes there. But without a doubt, the McMath Air Solar Telescope uh, has been my favorite telescope. I just think that it's fun uh, to use. And had a great staff. And it had a great staff, and I've been on for about 20 years. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, you know, I'm just going to go through a few pictures here that just show this uh, telescope because it's truly a unique um, structure. You know, it's about 100 feet high, uh, as, you, as you see that seven lane on its side. And it's built, most of it is built into the, into the mountain. So if we go to the next slide. Could I just point out quickly that uh, for people here, this shot is looking eastward from the 2.1 meter. And in the valley, just before that mountain in the background, that's Tucson, Arizona out there. OK. Um, and so um, the, you are going to see several slides of various students that have helped out in this uh, lunar uh, exosphere project. Um, 
So while you're look, looking at them, including one who fell asleep there on the right, uh, just to give a feel for the telescope, you know, this thing is built at an incline to point at the polar axis, so it's about 32 degree incline. And so about 300 feet of that 500 foot tunnel is actually underground. So I'm gonna take you through a series of slides going through that, that tunnel, uh, just because it's, it's an impressive structure. Okay, so next slide. Uh, so if you walk down the, the, the side of the mountain up to, up to which there is no real path, and um, if you look at all the drawings that you can find about the uh, McMath telescope, various schematics, they never show you that it actually comes out the side of the mountain. If you look closely on some, there it does show the attic tunnel. So on some of the schematics, you can see that. Okay, I haven't found one. The, the one I showed in the previous slide is the only one I've seen that indicated that something went out to the side. I'll look at my notes. Yeah, well, I, I'm sure the real uh, drawings do show it, but uh, I'm sure it's also no accident that they don't show it coming out to the side for most of the stuff that's published. But anyways, if you take that little hike down there, you, you get to the bat cave and you'll notice uh, Behind Mori there, there's a bomb shelter sign. Um, and so those is designed to be a bomb shelter. The problem is now that because so much dirt and debris has uh, come in, you can no longer close the doors. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see that from, it's called the bat cave for a reason, and bats in the upper right. And then you start to look up the tunnel, and there you're going to see the, the number three mirror uh, that we hiked up. And then it's a, it's a 1.6 meter, and it has this very famous uh, for, uh, chip in it. I always called it the fiducial. The I fiducial. Never, and I never called it the chip. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you, Claude, say how that, how that happened. Uh, the story, as I recall, since I wrote the history paper, I think it was circa 1972, Ron will talk about the McMath is actually three telescopes in one. Off to this either side of the main 1.6 meter are 2.9 meter solar telescopes as well. All the telescopes, all the instruments are right, all the optics right up and down on a railroad-like track going up and down the telescope, which you can see there. I think it was 1972, the east auxiliary was being lowered down the <coughs> tunnel. Now they're all lowered with, uh, with big mechanical winches. They were lowering it down for uh, maintenance and discovered when they got to the end of the cable it was not tied off. <laughs> the imaging mirror, which was a metal mirror for that telescope at the time, went zipping down the telescope until it hit uh, just above where the imaging mirror in the left hand uh, image there is, at which point the, uh, the tunnel uh, restricts down. Above that it's a wider thing where the auxiliary telescopes are, then it narrows down. When it hit that, the imaging mirror came off of its mount it went rolling down the telescope until it hit the carriage of the 1.6 meter imaging mirror there. The imaging mirror, you know, I'll step around where I can point. I, there are a couple of uh, mirror clips at the bottom. The mirror was facing the other way. When that mirror impacted the, uh, the mirror carriage, destroying that mirror, I'm told this mirror jumped up about four inches then settled back down into its uh, mirror cell. Unfortunately, one of these clips nulled the, uh, nulled the mirror, which is a beautiful forged mirror, by the way, and uh, created a, 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 a field modification indentation. <laughs> uh, after it was taken out of service at that point, and uh, quickly in a bit of a panic, the National Solar Observatory under the, the direction of Keith Pierce at the time uh, procured a 1.5 meter 
serving, which is an ultra low expansion ceramic uh, blank. It was polished very quickly and put into service. When I got to the telescope in 1986, that mirror was in service. It was known to be a problematic mirror. It uh, had a rolled edge, so the, the mirror was already masked off. But uh, I assisted the, the engineer at the time, since I was the new guy, to test that mirror. We did a, we set up an apparatus to do a knife edge test on it. Discovered not only did it have a rolled edge, it had a central peak, and a lot of what's called under polish. It was very rough. It was a terrible mirror. So out of storage, we pulled out this old chipped quartz mirror, set that up and, and uh, inspected it, and its surface was beautiful. So it was put back, it was re-illuminized at that point and put back into service and has been the primary mirror since. When it was put back into service, I made sure every time the mirror was removed that the, uh, that, that chip, for lack of a better word, was put at the vertical up position. Therefore, there's a good reason for that. When you're designing instrumentation, you often need to figure out where the pupil image of the telescope is. And every pupil image in the telescope, that shows up as this beautiful dark spot on the, uh, on the image of the primary mirror. So that's why I refer to it as a fiducial. You knew where your pupil image was, and you knew what was vertical up by where that was in the image. So that's... Uh, Sorry, I went on a little bit. That's, that's the story of that year. <laughs> that was a good story, Claude. I liked it. And also, okay. I shall also say, is that uh, led to a lot of confusion because a lot of papers uh, then referred to the McMath as a 1.5 meter. And uh, that was not really corrected for quite a long time once that 1.6 meter mirror went back into, uh, into service. So for quite a while, uh, Phil Goody at Big Bear was talking about uh, building the world's largest solar telescope and there was this guy out at Kitt Peak beating the table saying, no, it's actually not the only 1.6 meter solar telescope. So I think he uh, used hush money and bought me out. <laughs> okay, next slide. Uh, Okay, so you're getting a, another view of the, of, of, the, of the tunnel here as we hike up from the number three, excuse me, from the number two towards the number, number three. And as Claude has just uh, described, you can see the fact that the tunnel is, is wider uh, and then narrows down. And uh, the uh, east uh, auxiliary mirror is on the left and the west auxiliary mirror is on the right. Um, and then on the, on the far right, when you turn around, you're starting now looking back up the tunnel and you can um, see the number three mirror, which is gonna be right above the observing room. And uh, then number one mirror is at the top of the solar uh, tower. So if we go to the next slide, then you know, we have some pictures taken right up at the, at the solar tower and the picture at the bottom makes it pretty clear you can see the three separate uh, uh, telescopes each one is independently uh, operated uh, and in this particular one only the, the main is is open um, but independent of the number of trips that i have made to 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 pit peak every time um, i go there i i hike up to the top one or more times and, and which they take people up because it's a gorgeous view. Uh, a couple more students there, as as well as um, Claude will recognize Ed Merkowitz on, on the right, uh, my colleague who's been in, involved in uh, all of these uh, uh, lunar projects that we've been doing. Okay, next slide. And so once you get to the top, you know, there's the view of the, the fountain. Um, didn't point it out, but you know, there was a solar, so the vacuum telescope, which was the vertical structure that fit in all these pictures that you've seen uh, of McNabb itself. And uh, we had to take a selfie there on the left. So if we go to the next slide, then 
The other thing that I, I do every opportunity I get is I watch sunset. Um, now the clearest um, conditions on this particular night, but if you go up to the top, you can watch sunset. But it's probably better to watch it uh, in from the observing room and watch the West End Snowy because you see it projected there and you can see the sun setting on the horizon. Again, we have a, a bunch of clouds, so this makes the sun look a little more like Jupiter in this case. Um, and I've been meaning to, but did not add to this collection, I have seen hundreds and hundreds of green flashes. Oh. They're very easy to see when you're watching in projection. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, then, okay, so now this is the observing room, and we're going to start talking about the observations that we make uh, on the moon. Um, the, something's been going on since 2009, and one of the benefits of, of the McMath was we could set up at what's called the North Port here, and we didn't interfere with the uh, daytime observations of the sun because they're made on the, uh, the center or the main table. So we asked for time, um, just uh, like five or six nights, and just to do a, if you will, an engineering one. Just try to see if we could detect the solar emission off the limb of the moon, given how you know bright the, the, the moon is. And so we just went down there and we did it, and it worked like a charm. Show you some data a, 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 little, a little later on, and so that you know resulted in a in a publication. But more importantly, it got us funding then to continue a a, a long term study that's uh, been going on then from 2011 to the present day to look at this sodium cloud around the moon, and then we expanded to also include potassium. So. Um, you can see from this picture, the instrument is, is very long. Uh, it's you know, over uh, seven feet. So I'm standing on, a, on some part of a small stool in the background to get up on, on, on top of the, the instrument. But the, the key here that you will see is a high spectral resolution instrument, and that's what's needed to pull out the emission line. Uh, of sodium and, and potassium because our objective is to measure the line profile of, of the sodium emission and potassium emission because what we want to determine is the temperature of the gas and the velocity of the gas not just you know take pictures that the other people had, had, had done so if we go to the next slide um, you will we'll see the uh, modern control there right out of the 1960s with an upgrade to the PDP 1173 in 1983. Um, some, I lie a little bit when I say it's still run by a PDP 1173 because uh, the plot knows that it's, somebody got a PC in there and wrote some code so it's a, uh, it has a PDP 1173 emulator run by a PC. Um, but the PC, the PDP 1173 is still there. Nine track tapes uh, and all. And one of them has lights on, so it always makes a good show. And the KMAC rack is still used. And the KMAC rack out of the 70s is still used, yeah. We don't need it for our instrument. Um, so if we go to the next picture then, you'll see how the do our observation. So this is looking down on the top of our instrument. And so there's a there's a large white foam core or um, basically 30 by 40 inches. So you're looking at an image of the moon depending on uh, whether your perigee or apogee is anywhere from 31 to 41 inches in diameter. Um, and so even though they did make, uh, add some encoders, and get the computer control for the telescope. It's not a computer control telescope, it's a computer assisted telescope. 
because the computer actually has no idea where the telescope is pointed. All it can do is count little pulses and make relative uh, calculations. And occasionally it makes big mistakes. <laughs> but, um, but the point here is, for our observations, what all we really needed to know is find the crater. Can you see the six that we initially used? And then you offset from the crater east, west, north, or south, and then position yourself on the limb uh, of, the, of the moon, as you see on the right. And so we've been using either two or our minute um, field to view, which for this telescope translates into two or three inches. Uh, and then, so that's the, you see spatial, a little over two or 300 kilometers in diameter. And there's no spatial information with, within that. Our instrument completely scrambles it. And what we are doing is just collecting all the light uh, within that aperture, and that's what's going to allow us to make these uh, line profile measurements. And our typical exposure is uh, five minutes. So if we go to the next slide then, you now actually see the data that, that we take and the fact that we are not imaging uh, the sky, we are imaging the number two mirror. So as Claude pointed out earlier, if you image at a pupil stop, you can see that chip in here. Uh, the difference between the, the two, uh, well, the, I shouldn't say the difference. That in this particular case, somebody put a, a black um, piece of paper to cover up the chip. Uh, I ultimately went down and removed it. I prefer a cleaner chip. Um, but it, as Claude says, provides a producial, so always let us know where we're looking. And so the type of data that we get is that since this is a fabric pro, um, its transmission is absolutely symmetric. So those ring patterns that you're looking at are constant wavelengths. So your wavelength is a function of radius. So if you take the image on the left, and do what we call a ring sum of equal area annually, you then create the spectrum on the right. Uh, as mentioned, this is, this is high spectral resolution, so our wavelength coverage is about one angstrom. Um, because all we want is to get that emission feature from the moon, whether it's sodium or potassium, and that emission feature actually has a, um, uh, with a hyperfine structure, the S, S, S result doublet, whereas we can't result the doublet itself, we actually can see the fact that the doublet is making the emission line slightly wider. Uh, so we have enough resolution so we can say intrinsically what the, what the width of the emission line is and ultimately what temperature uh, that implies for the gas. Um, so if we go to the next slide then, showed <laughs> earlier an image where you know, it showed the sodium emission going out several lunar radii. Well, we can't measure it out that far, but um, the radius of the, of the moon is a little over 1,800 kilometers, and so that's a green uh, set of crosses on the left block. And you can still see the sodium emission uh, at, at that point. And by the time we're out to about a degree from the moon, we no longer detect any sodium emission. Uh, sodium goes much further out than potassium. Um, so the, the, the in, you know, locations off the limb of the moon, and you can tell by the time you get to purple, uh, which is the 1350 kilometers, you can no longer see the potassium emission. Now, having said that, I'm going to tell you that this is, quote, typical data i.e. it's the best data that we have. <laughs> um, in the sense that we do have some stronger signal, but typically we cannot see, pota potassium just does not go out that far. Typically potassium is only seen in the first or second 
um, offset that we make from the limb. So that blue or uh, red is usually all the further we can see potassium. Potassium just being a heavier atom than, than sodium just has a, a much smaller scale height uh, and is also then not subject um, as strongly to radiation pressure. So really just doesn't get uh, blown up off the surface the way that the sodium does. So what makes for better data for you? Was it just a uh, good transparency, your instrument working well, or was there a denser uh, atmospheric plume of potassium at that point? Um, it's the latter. It's what's going on at the moon which, which is dictating this. Um, we don't have all the answers as, as to why there are there are certain patterns and i'll show you some uh data in a moment that gives some of the indications of when particularly potassium uh is is fainter and brighter um so that's one of the reasons for why this is a multi-year study uh because you want to look at it not just at the phase of the moon you want to look at it as what's happening at different terms of the solar cycle and i would be and i would love to tell you of the, oh, I don't know, 200 nights I've spent at the telescope in the last six years, then on one of those nights I saw the moon get hit by a CME. That is what I've been waiting for. It has never happened. The only CME that's gone off when I've been at the telescope, the moon was nearly full and in the magnetotail, tail and therefore completely shielded from the high energy charged particles from the sun. So that is supposed to produce a very strong signal. Uh, so I didn't get, didn't, haven't had that fortune yet. I got two more observing runs if they close at the end of September to hope that this happens. Okay, if we go to the next slide, um, one of the ways that, that you have to think about our observations, and you'll notice I flipped an earlier picture around on the right uh, to, to indicate that, you know, when you're at full moon, you're in that magnetotail. But what I'm demonstrating with the drawing on the, on the left is those are the line of sights that you are looking at the sodium and potassium emission uh, uh, at, at the moon. So then relative to the sun, when you look at the moon at first or third quarter, you're looking near the, re the, sub the subsolar point. So, because you're, you're looking at essentially what's called a local time noon from the moon's perspective. So at first and third quarter, you would expect to see uh, enhanced emission or brightened emission line of the sodium and potassium. As you get to full moon, then um, since you're looking off the limb, if you look off to the, to the right of, of that picture, which would be on the west side as you look up at the sky, um, then that's, that's the dust side. In other words, that terrain has been sitting in the sunlight for two weeks and is about to go into shadow. Whereas if you look off the east side, as you stare up at the night sky, that uh, part of the moon has now just come back into, into sunlight. So one of the things which, which happens here, uh, and if we go to the next slide, uh, what you see in the bottom plots are the intensity of the sodium potassium emission as a function of uh, lunar phase angle. Uh, for those peers in the crowd, phase angle does not have a sign associated with it. It's just the, the, the Earth, Moon, uh, Sun angle. Uh, we put the negative sign in called modified phase angle so we can tell the difference between be before full moon, you know, in the uh, waxing phase versus the after full moon or waning phase. But what you see is as the moon uh, goes from minus 90 or first quarter towards full moon zero, the intensity of both sodium and potassium is decreasing. And for potassium, it's actually decreasing rather dramatically. Um, then as you come out from, from full moon, uh, you start to see the, the in, in emission increase again as you're heading towards local noon. 
But also what is what has happened is by going through the magneto tail, you may not be being hit now by solar wind particles, but you are being uh, hit by magnetospheric ions in the Earth's magneto tail. And that is effectively stirring up those top few atomic layers of the regolith and bringing more sodium and potassium closer to the surface so they can be liberated by UV photons. Um, I should have said earlier the four mechanisms which we mentioned, UV photons are considered to be um, the dominant source, what's called the pho pho um, uh, photo stimulated emission. Um, so one of the other things then that we are looking at that affect intensity is um, have we caught the moon when it was in a meteor storm? Because it's known that if, you know, if the surface of the moon uh, has an enhanced uh, uh, meteoric bombardment, there will be enhanced um, sodium and pota potassium production and the emission lines will be brighter. So then the other result, which you see in the top here, I, you know, I said we measure line profile, so we, you know, we measure line widths. And you see, as you come in from first quarter to full moon, the line width is increasing. Um, but in sodium, it's a moderately symmetric looking process. As you go into full moon, the, the line width looks wider. We, we, we have some reasons why we think that is. And then as you get away from full moon, it, uh, towards third quarter, it then goes back to the levels that you, you saw in your first quarter. In this case, what we believe is happening is the dominant uh, source of, of, of sodium or potassium emission should be caused near the subsolar point. And so those particular atoms that have the highest velocity and can make it from the subsolar point to the terminator um, that are what we see when we make our observations near full moon. And as you remember from a previous plot, that's your dusk and dawn configurations. Um, so if you if you can go back one slide, okay, what we're saying here is that a lot of the sodium production is being made, you know, uh, at uh, at high noon, but it migrates towards the uh, to, towards the dusk and dawn terminators. Uh, but only the most energetic particles are going to be able to make it to there. And so when they get to our field of view, which is positioned at what would be referred to. Uh, 6 a.m. on the dawn side or 6 p.m. on the dust side, then by only seeing these high energy particles gives us an appearance of wider line width because we won't be seeing more energetic particles. Okay, so we go forwards, then, and um, I cannot explain this at the moment. Potassium in this particular month, May of 2014, was showing a completely different behavior. Uh, we are working with a modeler who thinks he might understand this, but he hasn't shown us his models yet. But it was basically, it had one width coming from first quarter to full moon, and then after you came out the other side, it was entirely a different width. Um, now, part of that answer may be, I keep talking about the greatest production rate being at the subsolar point. It is possible that it's actually shifted away from the subsolar point, not at noon, but maybe at you know 11 o'clock or something like that, being shifted towards the dawn uh, terminator. So if we go then um, to, to the last slide in this presentation, this is a larger data set, a similar pattern to what you saw in May of 2014, but it's all the data that we took in a six month uh, period or seven month period there to uh, be coincidence with the Laddie spacecraft uh, at the moon. 
And so whether you look at it in November or any of the other months, we have data in every month except for March, you, you see the same basic pattern. There's some variability, but the line width gets, gets broader as you go around towards full moon and then falls off. And again, it's fairly symmetric looking. Okay, uh, one more slide. And um, since no one asked, the picture on the, on the front cover of my slide is out of the moon. It's up Jupiter, uh, taken by the Juno mission. Um, so I just concluded my, my, my one hour uh, interview to be invited back to give <laughs> a talk about the Juno mission. However, I will only do that one in person. No. Uh, do you think we might allow him to stop by sometime? Okay. <laughs> Only if you bring donuts, I think I heard. <laughs> no, is there, a, is, it, is there a donut store in, in Big Bear City? Uh, oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. The good one closed, unfortunately. We still have Bonds and where, where do yeah. OJ's. Oh, OJ's. OJ's by Stater Brothers. Oh, okay. The yes, yeah, so there's one I didn't know. Anyway, Ron, no, you're more than welcome here. Anytime, I'd be, uh, we'd be more than proud to show you through that this other 1.6 meter solar <laughs> telescope. Well, we've got to keep at least one 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 operating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. But no, you're. You, we'd be very happy to have you out here. Teresa and I have plenty of room at our place, and. Uh, and if you come near a new moon, uh, we can drag you out to uh, one of the star parties put on by our uh, our club here. We have fairly, for Southern California, we have some of the best dark skies. In with, Southern California? In Southern California, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Anyone have any questions on, 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 on the moon? Questions? Questions? The only question I have is a term I'm not familiar with, Raleigh. What is that? Is that a unit of measure? Oh, Rayleigh? Yeah, Rayleigh? That's, a surface, that's a surface brightness unit. Um, it actually refers to number of photons um, per square centimeter per second per square radian. So it's, it's a surface brightness measurement. Okay, thank you. Got it. Yeah. And do you say Rayleigh? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Really? Really? Uh -huh. Any other questions? Well, join me once again in thanking uh, Dr. Ron Oliverson for taking the time to speak with us and uh, welcome him back anytime. anytime. Yeah. Ron, thank you. And I'm sure your day is getting kind of long, so we'll uh, let you go and we'll see you out here one of these days. Hopefully, I can arrange that. I, I, I uh, would like that. Okay, well, again, it's my pleasure to talk to you, so um, have a good good evening, and you, I guess you guys can go have dinner now. <laughs> <laughs> good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>